Hello and welcome to a panel discussion exploring St. Lucia's readiness for a more inclusive society for the blind and visually impaired. This program is part of activities to observe Blindness Awareness Month 2022 under the theme, I am more than what you see, spearheaded by the St. Lucia Blind Welfare Association. My name is Jesse Leons, Public Relations Officer of the Association, and I will be steering what we anticipate will be dynamic and insightful discourse in this program. And now to introduce our panelists, we have first on Mr. Anthony Averill, Executive Director of the St. Lucia Blind Welfare Association. We have Ms. Jessica Jacoby, Vision Education Support Teacher from the Ministry of Education. We have Ms. Signa Matthew Makarovich, a senior policy analyst from the Office of the Prime Minister. And we also have Ms. Binter Ernest, human rights policy, doing human rights policy within the government of St. Lucia, as well as Ms. Eustatia Felician, supervisor of the Denry Child Development Center and a disability activist. The last two will be joining us later on in the program. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Averill, I want to start with you. Uh, one of the common cliches when it comes to public engagement on social inclusion for the blind and visually impaired is that there are, quote, barely any uh, persons that have this type of disability in my area, in my neighborhood, in my country. I want us to establish in, in this program, let's define what the, the obvious term blindness, but also uh, visual impairment. And if you could report on the rate of people in St. Lucia who are blind and visually impaired. Well, thank you, uh, Jesse. I uh, want to thank you for giving us this opportunity, particularly as you have already established, this is the, around this time of year, we celebrate Blindness Awareness Month. This year it started from the end of April and will continue through June. Um, this was, of course, a um, misconception, and uh, we lived with it for many years. But it is what that drove the St. Lucia Blind Welfare Association into the um, a direct and a de deliberate <coughs> um, effort to do one, one um, educate St. Lucians with regard to the fact that we have people living among us Affecting, affected by blindness and vision impairment. Two, educate St. Lucian regarding the fact that blindness is not the end of life. And three, educate St. Lucian with regard to the fact that blind VI people have the right to enjoy all the privileges of society, but even more so, they also have a right to be given the opportunity to contribute to the continuing development of their own society. So um, we have one of the hallmark, hallmark of the St. Lucia Blind Welfare Association from its beginning back in the 60s to date, we have been relentless in pursuing this effort. Um, and this is what that drove us to start to mainstream children in the regular school system. So the St. Lucia Blind Welfare Association literally drove government in starting a, an education program in the regular school system for children living with blindness and vision impairment because you, they had them in the schools, but they would not even, they did not even realize that. Um, with St. Lucia's understanding of blindness, it, it has to do with those persons with absolutely no sight, not even light perception. How wrong? Um, for example, I have light perception in my right eye, and what that is, I am able to see the difference between light and darkness. That's all. So I shouldn't be surprised if you ask me to turn on the lights. <laughs> no, you should not be. Absolutely, you should not be. <clears throat> but more, a number of persons are. Ah, I said, but you, you say he's blind and he's, he's saying he's asking to turn light. Man, that, that man can see that. That, that man playing trick. <laughs> you understand? Um, but anybody who is not able to use your sight to function normally, it means that the sight has an issue. The sight has become impaired. 
and compromised so that you find through the years you have people affected with physical blindness um, have huge issues, but also those with low vision who had, had their own kinds of issues as well. They were not able to see, to do what they need to do, but yet people believe that they, 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 they are just playing a part. But there is, we can go for hours on these things, Jesse, and I know you have a, a number of questions here for us. Um, what have we done? In terms of, of, of transforming the society, we started with education. We also um, formed social groups, like clubs and so on. And we engage Lucians at all levels of society, from the rum shops to you know what. There was a time in St. Lucia, if they see someone like me in a social event, garçon could look at me, but I could a moon. We have come a long way from that. I don't hear that quite so much anymore. However, we still have a long way to go. So the question is, how ready are we to be an inclusive society? Not ready yet. But we are on the way, OK? Um, <clears throat> one of the, the problems that we've had, and you said that uh, people usually say, uh, but we don't have blind people in our community. This drove us to start what we call a mapping and registration program. In this day and age, we are tired of hearing people saying that they don't, they don't have blind people in their community. So we are making a special effort to register every single individual living with physical blindness or some form of vision impairment. And uh, we need the assistance of every solution to ensure that we can achieve this. We have, been we have relied and make good use of projection es estimates, how many persons you may have that are, are blind in, in the population. We use the WHO and, and other estimates. But we want, we, within the next, we started last year, we want within the next couple years that we will be able to speak from an educated standpoint that the St. Lucia's population of persons living with blindness and vision impairment uh, happens to be A, B, C. Okay? So this is going. It took us a while because although we met various groups, including um, governments, um, uh, ministries, and groups, and so on. It took a while for them to understand the need for such a, pro a program. But now, um, I'm happy to report that many of the, the uh, groups have indicated to us that uh, they now have a better appreciation for it, and that they are, being, they are a lot more forthcoming. Um, this, why should we do this, Jesse? It would help us to develop appropriate response strategy. When you know what you have, the size of what you have, and what their needs are, then it puts you in a better place to plan appropriate um, intervention. OK? Now, we do not only want to know numbers and what their needs are, but we also want to know what have they got to offer, because blindness affects people at any stage of life. You could be born blind, but you could also become blind um, later in life, in your 50s, your 60s, 70s, 80s, your 20s. It doesn't really matter, because it has no respect of persons. It will strike at any point, any, any place. And there are so many conditions that, that, that contributes to it, you know. So we need to be a lot more aware. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So to, to people who are blind and visually impaired, social inclusion means being able to participate in all aspects of life, from family to your neighborhood, your community groups, and so on, um, even up to the national level. 
to operate at the fullest extent possible. I want to ask you, Mrs. Markovic, uh, if you could speak to us about government's interventions um, and intentions toward achieving a more inclusive society for the blind and visually impaired, as well as speaking to the extent to which the blind and visually impaired are, have provided um, input in the, 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 the planning process. Right, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you very much for this and thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I would also just like to just start off with just giving a bit of a background into it. So, Office of the Prime Minister has a customer service enhancement project. And the purpose of this project is to improve customer service in the ministry in which we're working in. Right now, we're working with the Department of Physical Planning. Whilst working with that department, we had a meeting with the Solution Blind Welfare Association and also the National Council of and for Persons with Disabilities. And in speaking to them in terms of what are some of the areas that we need to improve on with customer service, it became very clear to us that a lot of what was being said was, was matters that should have been implemented, that these are things that we ought to have been working on, which then led to the idea that we need to have a policy that can focus on customer service improvement for persons who are visually impaired, blind, um, persons with disabilities, and also um, elderly uh, persons. And so we started off a committee, and that commit um, committee comprises of members from the St. Lucia Blind Welfare Association, the National Council of and for Persons with Disabilities, the um, National Council of and for Persons, uh, Older Persons, we also have the Ministry of Health, a part of the, co the committee, the Department of the Public Service is also part of it, and physical planning. And so we have been working with the committee, committee now to, the, to look at all of these areas. So one of the areas in particular are the physical components. How can we now improve the government service to make it more accessible for persons who are for, you know, blind, visually impaired, uh, persons with disabilities, elderly persons, what can we do to improve? We also look at it in terms of the customer service. When persons come to us you know, from this um, uh, group, how are they being treated? How can we ensure that they, have, they feel more, um, yeah, that, it, that it is, the services are accessible to them? And we also looked at um, the employee aspect of it. How can we improve on our facilities, improve on our training so that you know, persons who are visually impaired, blind, or elderly, that they, they feel that they are part of it. They don't feel in any way that they are secluded. Because one thing that we don't want to create is two societies, where one society feels, you know, they are able-bodied, they have access to everything. And those persons who have any form of disability, they find themselves not feeling included. So, so far, we have gone through this process. We have actually created a number of details. And one of the things that we have recognize is that a lot of what we have um, in, that we are working on to include in the policy uh, they are they're doable for example training you know training our officers training to to understand the needs of, of persons who fall in those various categories you know training our employees so that they understand what persons need as well so um, at this stage we are at the point of just drafting up this policy we have already gone through the, the process of getting the information and we are now at the draft stage and also looking at funding how can we get funding to look at um, in terms of the facilities etc you know what sort of support that we can get because it's you know we want to ensure that hey yes that we we have the policy in place but that we also have the facilities that are going to ensure that you know it's it's um yeah that access is available we also want to um, um have a lot of our um, uh, PR done in that regard as well. So at some point we will be doing a lot of campaigning because there has to be more awareness of the needs of persons who are visually impaired, who are blind, who are you know have a form of disability. You know it's just critical in our society that we ensure that every single person has an opportunity to showcase their skills and to be part because we are all gifted in some way, and it's important that every single person has an opportunity. To explore the gifts and to feel that to feel the, the level of independence that is necessary. Wonderful. So we are well on our way to a disability policy draft. Yes. Yeah, so we yes yes. At this Wonderful. point, we have already we have the content and is um, crafting it and then having discussions with our stakeholders so that we can have a document that we can now present to the cabinet and to get their uh, views on it. Yes.
Okay, wonderful. So, uh, Mr. Averill, we're seeing a, a distillation of priorities for uh, persons with disabilities here in St. Lucia with focus on uh, persons living with blindness and, and visually impairment. How do the, the ongoing interventions and existing um, arrangements made for uh, persons living with, with blindness and visual impairment, uh, how does it coalesce with the perspectives of, or, or rather, how does it address the, the challenges of blind of the Blind Welfare Association members who have had the opportunity to indicate their needs uh, living in the St. Lucian society? Well, we are very happy that the process is continuing. Um, the challenge is there. We are all challenged to ensure that we can, we can um, bring this process to sort of fruition and so that it begins to be transformed to have real meaning for the persons living in the various communities. Um, the, <clears throat> for us, inclusion means that we dream of the time when anyone who is living with blindness or vision impairment in anywhere in St. Lucia will not have necessarily have to co come to the St. Lucia Blind Welfare Association for service, that the services that are being provided in his or her community will be um, accessible to him or her, that, that these services are, are, are so uh, fashioned that the needs of constituents with blindness and vision impairment are also being addressed. Now, we have been agitating for policy for some time, for quite some time. Um, back, in the, back, back in the 90s, um, late 80s, 90s, and it was not only in St. Lucia, all, all over the world we were agitating. We had, you had a, um, the World Blind Union, the Disabled People's International, and so on. Um, the International Labor Organization was another important um, uh, vehicle that has been used to try and change the world, um, the, the way that the disability issues are being handled in the world. And St. Lucia is part of, of, of the globe. So um, the, it, it, it took some time um, to the point where there were some significant breakthroughs, which we will be addressing um, during the course of this discussion and uh, with regard to international um, uh, agreement and, and, and so on, policies and what have you, which of every nation uh, who are members of the United Nations are party to. And we will be addressing this later in, in this discourse. But we have to be able to find a, um, a mechanism, a framework, that makes these things real in Little St. Lucia. And that's where we are at. And that's why I am so happy when you, we find people with the kind of passion um, Signa has for this project, for what, what um, she is doing out there with her group. And then and our other panelists, um, the, the, the Miss Ernest and, and, uh, and, and so on. So it's, it is saying to me that we are beginning to get somewhere, but it has to be continued. Um, the, let's look at sports, for example. Um, blind VI students in our various schools should be made to be part of physical activity and physical training, OK? Um, we still see that um, there are some places where they are not as involved as they should be, okay? Even at, in this time and, 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 and at this time of, at this point in time. So this is just to give an idea of, of what, from the St. Lucia Blind Welfare Association standpoint, what we mean inclusion, okay? Um, we, for example, as part of the, this blindness, this, uh, the Blindness Awareness Month activity for this year, we make a special effort to reaching out to communities. Why is it that you have 
St. Lucian's always slamming dominoes all over the place. How many uh, persons in their, in, their, in their own community who are blind, who they, some of them used to play dominoes before, but now they have lost their sight, they are thinking that they cannot play dominoes anymore. And that, so they are just being left out. You know, so we may, we have been making a special effort, reaching out to the communities and said, no, 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 no. Hey, you know, the, the provide the opportunities for your fellow, your colleagues who are not able to see normally now that they can join and enjoy some good domino slam and sharing sabbats with you. So we have we we, we had a special activity at Opicon recently, and also one in the Castro City Hall. And the next community t being targeted would be Strasel. And so it's just to, we're demonstrating to people that there is no, blind VI folks have to be involved in all aspects of life. And as um, um, Singer said, we forgot to, you know, you know I, <laughs> I, have a, I have a son, and now I am a granddad, because he has a son. Um, uh, blindness did, did not get in my way. <laughs> 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 and uh, and um, um, J Jessica is indicating that um, uh, she may well go down that road too. And, uh, and I know there are some suitors. I, you know, she, uh, I hope she made a good choice, right? But this, this, this is a reality, you know. We are living. We, ha we are experiencing life. Some of us, uh, you are in relationship and it breaks down. It happens to blind people too. Some blind people are, 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 are divorced, you know, whatever. These are the fact, facts of life. We are living, we are part of the society. We didn't come from Mars or Jupiter. No, we are here. So <clears throat> we are saying, if we speak inclusion, we need inclusion. We know we have to make special provision in a number of instances. For example, before the, the discussion start, and um, we were looking at some of the critical areas. One of the um, areas where persons with disabilities are, are experiencing some dis discomfort and, and is when it comes to transport transportation. You know, there are some islands, like for example in Trinidad, they have, um, they have something called dial a ride. You know, we, are, we are not there yet, but I can tell you there is a, a great need for something like that, okay? Um, and so many, you know, the, the, we can go on and on, but the world, even the great creator, did not make everything happen in one day, all right? So, but we have to continue to, um, to aim to, toward total inclusion. Yes, we, we, we are biting it uh, incrementally, we, but um, little by little, we will achieve the goal. Okay. Uh, Ms. Dagaby, I want to come to you. We're inching toward a break, so I want to hear from you before that. Globally, uh, we have the blind and visually impaired being at particular risk of uh, being out of school due uh -huh. to parental poverty. Uh -huh. We have um, factors like uh, social stigma, also discrimination and lack of capacity of the education systems to meet their needs. Speak to us on, on if you, you can, um, St. Lucia's journey toward more in, a more inclusive educational system. What has been so far achieved and how far do we need to go? Okay, good day and thank you for the opportunity to be here and to be a part of this panel. Um, St. Lucia has come a, a long way, but from my experience, um, regionally and internationally, we, we have a very long way to go still, but we are, we are moving along. Um, we are even a little further than Trinidad, I believe, who started a long time before us. Um, before we had the system where children who are blind or visually impaired would be at what was then the school for the blind. But in the maybe late 80s or early 90s, the association began the integration program where students were um, integrated into the quote unquote normal schools or the regular schools. And we have itinerant teachers who I am I'm a product of the system because I was integrated into the Ave Maria Girls Primary School 
and I now serve as an itinerant teacher. Um, there has been great progress because even in my time as a student, technology was not what it is now. And so moving, we're moving from having to be totally dependent on Braille to being able to use technology. And being totally dependent on Braille, we only had a few teachers who could transcribe Braille into print. And so it was a challenge in terms of getting grades on time or even getting access to, to print material that we needed in Braille. But with the technology now, students can just go online or our students can type their assignments and submit and stuff. So we are really moving ahead also in terms of sensitization. Um, because of a lot of the work that the association has been doing, there is more sensitization and more acceptance of persons who are blind and visually impaired in the regular schools, not only by the teachers or, or school personnel, but also by other students. Um, our society is becoming slowly more open-minded to accepting persons who, who are blind and visually impaired in the education system. Well, I can say to an extent because there have been some experiences and it will not always be perfect, but it is my hope that um, we will continue to advocate and persons, especially the authorities, whether it be through the Ministry of Education, the South of Lewis Community, Community College, and whether it will be open-minded to accepting and understanding that we can do it just like any other student and we have been able to do it. Um, um, a lot of barriers had to be broken to get to where we are at now because persons who are blind and visually impaired, sometimes it is fought or was for that we were not able to do. And so a lot of work had to be done to ensure that we allowed the opportunities to be able to do. And, and the other thing too, too much to whom much is given, much is expected. So when you're given the opportunity, the important thing is ensuring that you do what it is that you have to do, take responsibility and produce, which is personally one of the things I've really been trying to do. Um, with the mention of treaties that St. Lucia has ratified, the Marrakesh Treaty, <coughs> excuse me, when, <coughs> excuse me, when implemented, it will really help St. Lucia because it is a treaty that allows persons more access to material, persons who are blind, visually impaired, and print disabled, to material that they can make, we can take this material and make them accessible, or we can access it from other countries without having any copyright infringement. So I'm looking forward to this treaty being implemented in St. Lucia so that our education system can benefit from it. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that, Ms. Jacobi. Mm -hmm. uh, just before we go to break, I just want to hear from you. What has been your personal experience um, in terms of the nature and scale of uh, exclusion and inclusion here in St. Lucia growing up? Uh, you have definitely been one of the, uh, should I say, shining agents for persons living with a blindness and visual impairment here in St. Lucia, um, being able to um, develop yourself and, and uh, attain, you know, much success on, on your merits. So speak to us about your experience. My experience has been a somewhat challenging one, I will say, but very rewarding when you are the one who has to break a lot of those barriers it can become very tiring or, or it can seem to be hard work but when you push and you see what's happening and who can benefit from what you have gone through then it it makes it a very good experience i can say that being someone who was born blind and who has gone up to the tertiary level of education um, for the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. 
being the first student who is blind to have attended the college, and to have left St. Lucia and to go out to study in Trinidad. At UWE, at the St. Augustine campus, there was not yet a disability services department, which by the time I left, there was now a, a thriving one. And so for me, yes, it has been challenging, but it has been rewarding, not only for me, but for a lot of persons out there. I'm grateful that I have been able to serve um, internationally as well. I, I served as the human rights officer for the World Line Union for almost two years. I'm still a volunteer with them. And uh, I'm looking forward to not only be used internationally, but my country, St. Lucia, recognizing my skills and my abilities and my passion that I will be used by my country as well to be able to contribute to making our society one that is even more inclusive and one that can understand the plight of and take into consideration the needs of persons who are blind and visually impaired. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, Ms. Jacoby, for that input and insight, actually. Uh, we are due for our first and only break in this program. Uh, you have just heard from uh, Mr. Anthony Averill, the uh, executive director uh, at the St. Lucia Blind Welfare Association. Also, Ms. Jessica Jacoby, a vision education support teacher from the Ministry of Education, and she's uh, blind and she's part of the blind and visually impaired community. Uh, of speaking of that, also Mr. Averill. And we also have Ms. Signa Matthew Makarovich, a senior policy analyst from the Office of the Prime Minister. Uh, so they have been speaking with you, opening up the discussion on St. Lucia, exploring uh, the extent to which we are ready for a more inclusive society for the blind and visually impaired. Uh, when we do come back from this very short break, we would have had a Miss, uh, Miss Mar Makar Makarovich, sorry about that, and uh, Miss Jacoby swapped uh, with uh, Miss Ernest, Human Rights Policy from the Government of St. Lucia, and Miss Eustacia Felicia, Supervisor of the Denry Child Development Center and Disability Activist, coming on to speak to us. Uh, we have so much more to speak on. We're talking employment, uh, accessibility to infra infrastructure, uh, just basic facilities here in St. Lucia. Are we ready? Stay with us. Set le si ka we jistwe ve min corona ek i ka fe mouvman ek an chay vitesse tan chak ka nef ka kouye pou vilijans publik la fe wolo pale an plas publik kon bol an me baz, ti boutik chonje distans social sis pie Rodiona lot, i ka twa zaitan, si ou santi ko pa kodyal, quarantine ko, patwe a kontak epi lot, an ka ou te twa pe espose. Se an ekwye, free one one obe ne pot klinik yo pwe ou. Le peyi a di mi a kle, sa vle di, le supermarket, famasi, epi etiem, yo aksesab avan se te twe. Pays à clé en plein, ça veut dire tout bagay fermé à 24 heures. C'est vu protocole comme sorti par bureau indication santé. Nous tout ensemble, ça sauver vermine corona. Si nous tout servi jidla à tout les. She's been watching, waiting, wondering when the sands of time will give way to a tide of change and for yesterday and today to become a new tomorrow, for a time when her sun can kiss the cheeks of your loved one and her stars can twinkle in her honeymoon skies, when her earthly embrace will reassure and calm your soul. to meet new challenges and to provide safe harbor to all who reach her shores. For her hopes and dreams still stand shoulder to shoulder, a prayer 
precious reminder of experiences yet to come. So, wherever your moments and memories take you, let her sense of adventure set you free. Thank you so much for staying tuned. This is a panel discussion exploring St. Lucia's readiness for a more inclusive society for the blind and visually impaired. This program is part of activities to observe Blindness Awareness Month 2022 under the theme, I am more than what you see, is being spearheaded by the St. Lucia Blind Welfare Association. Uh, we are continuing the discussion coming off of uh, insightful, dynamic uh, conversation just uh, from this past break. We heard from Mr. Averill, Executive Director of the St. Lucia Blind Welfare Association. Also, Ms. Jacoby, a vision education support teacher. Uh, we also heard from Ms. Signa Matthew Makarovich, a senior policy analyst from the Office of the Prime Minister, speaking on some of the interventions from the government uh, to make uh, our space, our society, more inclusive for the blind and visually impaired. We heard that there are plans in the works for a disability, uh, a disability policy and that will guide the way we are able to interact with the blind and visually impaired here in St. Lucia and of course grant them more accessibility with various services. Uh, we have uh, swapped uh, Ms. Jacoby and Ms. K Ms. Makarovic uh, for uh, Ms. Binter Ernest. She does human rights policy with the government of St. Lucia as well as Ms. Eustacia uh, Felicia. She's the supervisor of the Denry Child Development Center and disability activist. So thank you very much for being here and thanks to the uh, two panelists who just got off. Thank you so very much. Uh, we want to continue the conversation. We, we spoke a little bit about education before we got off the break. Uh, I now want to touch a little bit on employment and what that looks like for someone who is blind or visually impaired here in St. Lucia, Mr. Averill. Employment, it greatly contributes to the social inclusion of people with disabilities, Absolutely. without a doubt. And being able to earn wages, rely on yourself, be independent, your dignity, uh, productivity, gives you a sense of purpose. Um, hearing some of our members, Mr. Averill, that it, it, it is a point of, you know, concern for them, and particularly in this post-COVID climate that we, economic climate that we are uh, living in. What, uh, if you could just speak to where the association is at in terms of guiding and supporting members towards gainful, sustainable employment <laughs> that aligns with their individual skills and aspirations. And also, what, what has been the reception from corporate St. Lucia? Yes. Um, <clears throat> you have certainly, um, you are hitting the nail on, on, on the head. In fact, it looks like you are good batter. I'm <laughs> 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 <Play cricket. clears throat> see you love sports. <laughs> yes. Um, we can educate we can rehabilitate, we can do all of these great things, mm -hmm. but until we can provide access to what the ILO called decent, and then what we used to call gainful employment, the job is not done. Because at the end of it, um, a person wants to be able to own a living and it is incumbent on society to ensure that the right environment is uh, allows such development and that should include both private and public cent uh, sectors public and private sectors they are equally important where that is concerned. So, um, yes, a few of our people have been able to access employment, but it's just a few. The majority of persons who are living with blindness and vision impairment are not employed. And um, should that be? No. 
particularly in this day and age. So the St. Lucia Blind Welfare Association has been doing its best. It um, certainly introduced uh, blind VI students to <clears throat> computer technology and the various um, types of, of the technology that, that is now available. Um, we want them to ensure that they are properly trained so that it can be used as means of, of accessing employment. Um, we see a lot of, of, of activities are being generated online and, and, and inclusive, inclu including employment. So people who are, mo li who, who li are living with limited mobility, uh, this seems to be a sector that could um, open up um, a, a world of possibilities for them. And I'm talking about some of our, of our people. However, when it comes to employment, we are not only concerned um, or, uh, um, with regard to the elitist side of, 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 of our, our, our activities, the, 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 the people who have been able to, to access that, that level of, of academic knowledge and skills so that they would be able to, uh, to, to access some jobs. But we are also thinking about those who are perhaps at the lower end of the scale, you know, so that we need to be addressing the needs all around. And that's where it's a, it's a challenge for us, OK? So um, I remember when I was developing the Club 60 program um, back in the 90s, and um, one gentleman asked a question, I think he was from For I Saw. He says, uh, Monsieur Avril, Zoka fait tout ce bagay sala. Me en temps longtemps, travail kap moun de gafe, a sous affe development a présent, yon nom sa fe. So, ki sa zot kai fe, et toi les zot la? And I was taken aback by this question. Technology is great. But um, the whole, <clears throat> it is changing the whole dynamics. Now, what are you going to do? Because you have to cater for everyone. So it calls for a country to be creative, use all the creativity uh, skills that we have, and to ensure that all of our people have opportunity to dissent employment. And this, the St. Lucia Blind Welfare Association, Jesse, has tried many things, in, including we looked at the recycling, for example, because we saw great opportunities there. In fact, we can see great opportunities there. Um, but the way it, it, is, it, is, it was done, we pick up trash and we send it away to Asia or wherever. Our thinking is that how we should focus on how to convert trash to cash. And in this way, we would be able to create employment opportunity for some of our people at the low, lower end of, of scales. Okay? So that employment should be, it's not just about um, mouthing it, but we should understand what it takes to create it. How can we make use of the material that are available to us? St. Lucia, my, my grandmother told me once, she says, Saint Lucie, c'est en place qui béni. Bon Dieu, ben nous, assez bagaille, mais nous ni pour apprendre manière pour cultiver. St. Lucia is blessed. God give us enough to survive. But we have to learn how to, how to manage it. And that is our, that's our issue. Tying up with that, we also have to ha have a greater appetite and passion for things local. No, I'm going into areas that are not really 
but it, it, it contributes to this discussion. So I, I have cited them to show that we need to engage in a range of activities for us to be able to address the employment needs of persons living with blindness and vision impairment at various level of experience and skills. It is a significant problem. Employment is huge. And our people are screaming. They need jobs. They need jobs. And we have to find ways to provide access to jobs for them. And this has to be not just only a government policy. It has to be a policy which is by, which the private sector would buy into. And what I usually say to them is that, look, the persons who are currently employed, so if, some, if it so happens that their vision become compromised, are you going to send, just send them home? What about the investment that you have made in their development, their training and development? Don't you think you'll be depriving your company of, the, of, of, of a significant investment that you have made, the resources that you have spent. So there has to be a way to ensure that they are continuing to be employed. And in that way, you will also be able to provide openings for others out there who can well be part of your establishment, establishment and can also contribute to the, to, to the, to the, pros, uh, the, the prosperity of, of your, your company. So it it's behooves all of us to take interest because the, the interest that we, we, we take would be ours. We ourselves who are fully sighted, those who are fully sighted, many persons who used to be fully sighted are not now. So we have to plan ahead. We, when we are changing society, we are changing it for our benefits. It's not just for a few, it's for all of us and for our children yet to be born. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Averill. I, I now want to rope in you, Ms. Ms. Felician. Um, we've heard employment, we're talking education. <coughs> Speak to, well, it's been a you know, 70, Mr. Averill, a 70 year journey in terms of advocacy for the blind and visually impaired here in St. Lucia. Uh, uh, it, yeah, it is, it's, it's quite, quite a journey. You know, we yes. started back in the 50s with the Women Association, they sponsored the first um, two young St. Lucians and children and sent them to school in Trinidad, School Wonderful. for the Blind. So, so what does advocacy, uh, well, we've heard a bit from Mr. Avery, but what does advocacy look like in 2022 for the blind and visually impaired? Ms. Phyllis Young. Hi, good morning. Thanks. It's afternoon right now. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Um, the, the issues we had when Mr. Avril and them started and was sending to send, and the women came together to send the children to school, the issues still remain. What does it look like? Um, of course, the way we're going to uh, tackle the issues and the, and the um, strategies that we are going to use would change, but the issues still remain. And when Ms. Avril began speaking initially, he said about when people would say, where that blind person going to, that still exists. In communities, we still have that exist. And the, I'm not sure if funny is the word, the um, unfortunate thing is that sometimes it comes from people and places you don't expect it to. Mm -hmm. So you would take a child to the hospital or you t try to enroll your child at school and somebody wants to know what your child is doing there because your child has a disability, your child cannot see what is the child doing there. And even at schools, we have issues where if a parent has decided, even if a parent knows that the child has a disability or the child is visually impaired or blind and chooses not to tell the principal and enrolls the child at school. When the child gets into school, the school's first thing is not to embrace and integrate and include. They're going to call blind welfare or call the education officer and say that this child is not supposed to be here. Um, on what are y'all going to be doing or how are y'all going to support the child. And it wasn't, and I mean, I, I think I'm old enough. When we went to school, if a child came to the school, whoever presented at the school, the teacher did the best they could for the child. That does not happen anymore. What does advocacy look like with education? 
and, and not just grassroots education. We have to start educating persons who are supposed to know better. And I'm talking about nurses and teachers. So you're saying we have regressed in terms of our attitudes towards people living with blindness? I'm not sure if it's a regression or if it's a thing like Mr. Avril and Blind Welfare has done the work too well. So now people don't feel that they need to be doing it because there's somebody there who has to do it for us. Okay. Okay, so now that we have somebody else who's doing it and the government has started special education, so we have special education centers, we have special education teachers, we have Blind Welfare Association. Not our so problem. It's not my, our problem. So if we, have, if we see the problem, nobody's trying to in, um, include we're going to refer it to the relevant person. And when we refer it to the persons, we think that are the relevant persons. We're not referring to ask for how do I, how can I deal with this and how can I solve this? When we refer to it is, yo, Mr. Avril, one of yours over there, what are you going to do about it? That kind of thing. So from that kind of, from that space, how we reach the public would have to be different. What we say to them and how we reach them. What we expect of them. If we, de if we build an inclusive society, it's because a lot of the times we can be integrated and not included, okay? So we can, a child has a visual impairment and if it is known to SLBW that the child has an Im a visual impairment, the child will go to a regular school with assistance. What happens when the itinerant teacher is not there? Could be something else altogether. The child may be included in the setting. The child, is, the child is integrated into the setting, but not included into the school or into the school activities. And one very important point Mr. Avril pointed out was pe um, physical education. So the child is going to sit out physical education. Not because the child wants to sit out physical education, but because the teacher does not, has not gotten a way to involve the child or include the child into the special education, into the um, physical education. So that child is, will have to sit out um, physical education, even in, in employment too. Some employ there are some employers who are reluctant to hire persons who are blind or visually impaired or with any other disabilities because they think it's going to be a liability. What happens if that person hurts themselves on the job? Who's going to be responsible? And of course, it's going to take a little extra to train them into doing the activity, and they have to think about all of that. Um, unless and until we well, the, our, us as a society changes how we, we see and we view persons, whether blind or visually impaired or persons with disabilities, and we do not look at people as people's responsibility. So if you are blind, you are blind welfare's responsibility. And I'm going to blame Mr. Avril, they have done their job too well. So now anytime you see somebody's blind or visually impaired, they are blind welfare's so, um, thing. They're not ours. Mm -hmm. And that's where we have to look as soon as when we start to look at everybody as ours. And I pointed out in, a, um, in a, another forum some time ago, the disability issues are always an afterthought. We come in after everybody has thought of all the other groups and after or on, until and unless somebody with a disability keeps some noise. Then and only then they become a uh, an issue. Oh. I'm hoping that uh, with the disability policy that's coming on stream, we, we definitely see so far that we have engagement in the planning process well before implementation. And that's a good thing because a lot of the times we find that they plan for persons with disabilities um, without them. They're not part of it. And something else I need to um, point out, a lot of the planning goes on for the adults with disabilities and not a lot for the children with disabilities. It's just relegated to education. Yes, mm -hmm. just education. But those children are going to grow up and they're going to have lives. And we're talking about inclusion. And we're talking about including the whole human being, the whole child, okay? And beyond education, the child has certain has rights too. And those are not being addressed. Um, how, how much, just briefly before we head on over to Ms. Ernest, how, how well is, is the articulation of the rights of, of, of of the blind and visually impaired conveyed to they themselves? I don't think we're doing a very good job of that. I don't think we're doing a very good job of that. So these are things that we need to think of and um, we need to work on. There are going to be gaps. We've done a lot of good work. We've done a lot of hard work. We've done a lot of hard work. Um, SLVW has done a lot of hard work, even the training of teachers and ensuring that there are persons to drive the education of persons um, who are persons who are blind and visually impaired. They've done a hard work. But of course, there are going to be some slots that we need to fill in, and there are going to be some places that we need to pull up. And yes, 
that's probably one of ours. Okay, wonderful. Ms. Ernesta, to you now. Um, we heard um, the need for improved attitude, attitudes towards the blind and visually impaired, mm -hmm. um, not only in school, but in, in workplace, etc. Uh, speak to us on, on how the drafting, the, the considerations in that regard for the uh, disability policy. Okay, um, I cannot speak specifically to the disability policy which is currently being drafted. I have been included in, the, in a lot of the preliminary um, consultations. Mm -hmm. But in terms of changing attitudes and in terms of changing mindsets, I think from a policy perspective is where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. I think what is necessary is that government any government who comes into place has to has to articulate a rice based a rice right based um, approach to development, and without a and if we as as St. Lucia we are part and parcel of the United Nations, and one of the pillars of the United Nations is a rights based approach, and if we 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 need to first I think internalize this as 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 governments and policymakers, and then it can actually guide everything else that we do. Because when we, we talk about persons with disabilities, persons who are blind, persons who are, um, maybe have a physical disability, but we fail to realize that if we have a, a rights-based approach to governance, it covers every single marginalized group. Because inclusivity would mean the participation of persons from all demographics, all ages, races, sexual orientation, um, rural, urban location, this is what inclusive means, that we all have access, we all are participating in life in general. And I think in order to change attitudes is, we live in a able-bodied world. We live in a masculine, able-bodied world. <laughs> Most of our laws were drafted by men. <laughs> and the only way in which we got rights, in terms of the, the, the whole idea of speaking about rights, is through persons who were not able-bodied, or persons who were excluded, had to come in, whether it be women. You see, in St. Lucia, I even know that in terms of disability, and blind disability, that women played a, a major role again. That's another, that's another conversation. <laughs> but in order for us to change attitudes, a philosophy of rights based philosophy and governance needs to be articulated first and foremost by a government, and this can then seep down into the society. If, uh, as, uh, as Ms. Felicia indicated, they're always an afterthought, because no one able-bodied people do not think in terms of disabilities, right? So, so my, first, my first thing is governance. It starts from the top. If it doesn't start from the top and it's not articulated from the top, it's very difficult for it to actually seep into the various sections of society. Even within the ministries and, the, and, and government policymakers, most persons within government do not think of a rights-based approach to development. And training, training is essential, it is essential. The only way I am here right now speaking as a human rights policy person is because I was exposed to it. I was exposed to training in human rights and I have exposed myself to persons who are not like myself. And we need to be outside of our comfort zones, I think, in order for us to say, ah, and retrain our thinking. There's a lot of retraining I am constantly doing. Mm -hmm. I remember you spoke about meetings. And before being with them um, um, in human rights policy, we just get a facility for a meeting. We have a meeting and everyone is included. You're invited. Then my colleague at, um, at the UN office, Sami Bad Binta, like, why are we upstairs? Like, what are we doing upstairs here? We can't have an, a, a meeting upstairs, and it's already booked. But now, you know, for sure, whenever I book meetings, my meetings can never be booked upstairs in a facility. My meetings have to be on ground level so that it's accessible to everyone. So this is what I think how, in terms of us changing policy, and with the disability policy, which is currently underway. And I, I do commend um, Ms. Um, Marakovic for actually including, and she, she has brought in the necessary persons. So when you bring in the people who are to be affected, then I believe attitudes of able-bodied persons like ourselves can actually make the changes that need to be changed and ensure that everyone else is included in the society. Hopefully I didn't, I didn't miss any. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> uh, we have completely run out of time. I think this needs to be a, a, a part one, part two session. Yeah. Um, but Mr. Averill, I leave uh, last words to you. 
Yes, um, yes, we, ha we have run out of, of time indeed, but because I really wanted her to address the Treaty of Marrakesh, which yeah. she had, she really worked in, and it is, we want to see it fully implemented. Um, it's been ratified. Um, the, for example, um, as you, you know, you know, for years and decades, we have been driving this thing. I would admit to the fact that we probably spent a lot of time trying to educate the masses, but perhaps not enough time dealing with the upper echelon of the society, okay? Um, because you, several of the panelists made reference to the fact that government need to articulate, for example, a rights-based approach. Now, it's, uh, it's coming from international, but it ha has to be something cultural about it as well, okay? And for me, I would say I see a rights base side by side with responsibility. So I would say right and responsibility based approach, looking at St. Lucia's culture. Um, going back to some of the comment made by Ms. Felicia, for example, um, this is blind welfare's business, or this is um, that this, this agency or that agency. For people to understand, we have to get into a culture of doing it for ourselves. Where that is concerned, there is commonality between those who are blind and those who are sighted because they come from the same tree, the solution society. We sit back and someone do it for us. Whether you are from government, you are from blind welfare, or wherever, I have a need, you have to address it. Not realizing the first line of responsibility starts with me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, now sometimes I get myself in, in trouble when I say things like that because this kind of truth hits people hard in, hard in the face. It cannot be all about gouvernement, gouvernement. Neither can it, can it be all about um, this agency or that agency. It has to be about us, and we have to take responsibility. So that is why, um, Binta, I'm suggesting for us here, let it be a right and responsibility approach. approach. Okay, excellent. Wonderful. It's all the time we have for now. I'd like to thank all of the panelists, Mr. Averill, uh, Ms. Jacoby, Ms. Makarovic, uh, Ms. Ernest, and Ms. Felicia. Thank you so very much for your time. Hopefully we can meet once again uh, to further this discussion. This has been a panel discussion on exploring St. Lucia's readiness for a more inclusive society for blind VI persons. Uh, this program has been part of activities to observe Blindness Awareness Month 2022 under the theme, I am more than what you see, and it's being spearheaded by the St. Lucia Blind Welfare Association. My name is Jesse Leons. It's been a pleasure uh, presenting uh, this discussion to you. Happy Blindness Awareness Month to all blind VI persons here in St. Lucia. Do stay tuned for more programming. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks. <coughs>